All right, everyone, I'm excited to introduce Beverly Setzer. She's a grad student in the program for neuroscience at Boston University, working with Dr. Laura Lewis. She, re she received her BS in mathematics with a, with a minor in biological sciences from North Carolina State University. And there she worked at the, ba the Biomathematics Research Training Group. As a graduate student, she's been studying human brain dynamics during arousal from sleep, using fMRI and a lot of other really cool techniques. And today she's gonna to talk about her work using simultaneous EEG with fMRI to look at activation sequences across thalamic nuclei during awakening from sleep. All right, Beverly, we're really excited to have you. Go ahead and get started. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. I'm aiming for 45 minutes, but I haven't presented my work outside lab meeting very much. So I'm not sure exactly how the timing will be. Definitely feel free to ask questions along the way if possible. Um, yeah, it'd be great to have questions. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about how we used fast fMRI to delineate a sequence across the lamic nuclei during the transition between sleep and wakefulness. Well, I'm just trying to get this to change. Okay. So first I'll give you a bit of motivation on how behavior, arousal state, and brain dynamics are linked. Then I'll go through some of the previous limitations and talk about how we can use fast fMRI and simultaneous EEG to uh, look at this sequence of thalamic activity during behavioral arousal. Okay, so as you are probably aware, cognition dramatically alters between sleep and wakefulness. When people are asleep, they're not really aware of their environment. And then when they're awake, you can actively engage with your sensory environment. This difference in behavior is reflected um, across the different uh, sleep stages. So, People go from being um, actively being able to engage with a behavioral task to missing some of those cues. In this example, people are doing a self-paced breathing task. So they press a button on every breath in and out. And you can see that this subject is falling asleep and beginning to miss more cues towards the end of the trial. These behavioral changes are accompanied by alterations in cortical rhythms. So here, most strikingly, you can see that in the beginning of this uh, EEG spectrogram, there's this really high power oscillation occurring between 8 and 12 hertz, and that is the alpha rhythm um, in the occipital cortex. We see occipital alpha when people are awake with their eyes closed. Then as this subject falls asleep, you can see that the alpha power drops out and there's an increase in slowed rhythms. And this is reflected in the hypnogram. So EEG is classically used to define um, arousal state. So while we know that there are these really prominent differences in cor cortex between sleep and wakefulness, there exists a gap in knowledge in how deep brain regions are acting in concert to drive these changes. Specifically, we're interested in the thalamus because it has profuse cortical connections, which makes it aptly positioned to alter these dynamics across arousal states. And it's known to be a key controller of arousal state transitions. So animal studies have shown that if you stimulate specific regions of the thalamus, it can actually drive transitions between sleep and wakefulness. However, the thalamus is a very diverse structure composed of dozens of individual nuclei and each of these nuclei have unique structural and functional properties. So we are interested in answering the question, does a specific sequence of thalamic activity underlie behavioral arousal state transitions, or is this transition kind of happening in concert across the brain? Previously, this question was really hard to answer because while animals, invasive animal studies can give us really interesting clues to how these transitions are occurring by demonstrating causal effects of um, stimulating these deep brain stimuli. It can be really difficult to record from dozens of sim regions simultaneously. And while that still is possible, it's not currently possible to um, invasively record from the whole brain simultaneously. So um, imaging techniques allow us to record from the whole brain 
However, traditional fMRI um, samples too slowly and can't measure from individual thalamic nuclei with high precision. So we run into issues with spatial and temporal resolution and with traditional fMRI. So how can we measure from individual nuclei of the thalamus and regions of the cortex simultaneously at a high enough temporal resolution to actually capture these dynamics that occur really quickly when we transition between arousal states? And the answer to that for us was fast fMRI. So in the past 10 years, there have been advances with fMRI that allow us to image much more quickly specifically the invention of simultaneous multi-slice imaging. So typically um, we, with fMRI, we have slices across the brain. And with traditional fMRI, you would have to step through each of these slices one at a time to capture the image of the whole brain. With simultaneous multi-slice imaging, we can actually capture information from multiple slices at once. So in this image here, uh, there's five different slice groups which are colored across the brain. And you can see that there's three slices that are being um, captured at once. So it enabled us in this case to image three times faster than if we had to step through the whole brain at once. So these advances are really great that we can actually image faster and capture the bold signal more quickly. However, you might still be wondering how fast really is the bold signal to begin with, since it is a, the blood oxygen level dependent signal, it's not a direct measure of neural activity. So it is um, a bit more slow than other techniques. So you may be familiar with the canonical hemodynamic response function. Here, I'm just showing um, an example and you can see the stimulus at time zero and then the peak of the hemodynamic response isn't until five to 10 seconds after the stimulus onset. So it is a slower measure. And I think Laura talked to you guys a bit about this last spring or um, even maybe last year. Um, but she showed that the hemodynamic response is actually faster than we thought. So in this image here from her paper, the dotted line is what we would think that the canonical model estimates the normalized response amplitude to be to a specific stimulus frequency. So in this study, they are showing flickering checkerboards at different frequencies and then measuring the response throughout the brain. So you can see that the actual data had a much higher response than the canonical model predicted. So we can actually capture some faster information than previously thought using the bold signal and fast fMRI. However, there are some additional challenges when imaging more quickly. One of which is that when we image at these fast rates, we actually capture influence from the heartbeat and respiration and it's necessary to remove these influence for data analysis. So here I'm showing spectrograms um, from the bold signal. And you can see in these two examples that there's these really prominent horizontal stripes across the spectrogram. And these between a one and 1 1.5 Hertz are caused by the heartbeat. And then these stripes that are lower here is from respiration. And our lab devised a method to dynamically remove these from the data, um, but it's kind of important to keep in mind that if you want to image more quickly, you have to um, think about these additional signals that you might be capturing. Okay, so for our study, we did two experiments. Sorry, Beverly, can I ask a question on the last slide? Yeah, please. I was just wondering when you guys did that, did you measure heart rate and respiration? Um, like, did you have like the belt and stuff like that to help you figure it out? Yes. So we do two different methods in our lab. The first is exactly what you're saying to measure respiration and heartbeat with a um, pulse exometer, and then just see what frequency those are occurring at and remove that, those frequencies from the data using regression. This method that um, they developed and published, this is actually from 2020, not 2016, but um, uses basically they just give it there's a just we know the range for heart rate is between like one and 1.5 hertz so with this method hran it finds where the power is the highest in that band and removes that from the data so you don't actually have to record respiration and heartbeat simultaneously in order to remove this noise from the data 
Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so um, for my study, we did two different experiments. The first we did at three Tesla was simultaneous EEG. And the reason we wanted to capture EEG um, at the same time was because, like I mentioned earlier, arousal state is typically defined using uh, the cortical rhythms found in the EEG. Um, so we also captured behavior though, which is that same task I mentioned in the beginning where we have subjects press a button on every breath in and out. So we get these two different measures of cortical arousal state and behavioral arousal state while imaging across the whole brain. So for this study, the, our temporal resolution was 0 0.367 seconds, which is much faster than you could get with traditional fMRI. We used 2.5 millimeter cubed isotropic voxels, which is large enough to capture um, information from the thalamus and specific cortical regions. We used a simultaneous multi-slice factor of eight. So we had 40 different slices. For, so for this, us, this meant that we we're capturing five slices at once. So we're, we are um, capturing information five times faster than if we weren't using multi-slice acquisition. We had six subjects and 66 behavioral arousals in this first study. So um, in order to capture EEG inside the scanner, there's also some additional difficulties as you could imagine. The first is that there is the introduction of the ballistic cardiogram artifact, which occurs when you're capturing EEG data inside the magnetic field. So we have to use a, a specific reference layer to remove the influence of this artifact. And it looks kind of funny, as you can see, it's basically a shower cap with holes in it. And what this does is the shower cap acts as an isolating layer. So some of the electrodes are sitting on top of the shower cap and not making contact with the scalp. And those electrodes are picking up only noise, essentially, since they're not actually directly in contact with the scalp and then a subset of the electrodes go through and measure brain activity. So we can use this to regress out the noise using those BCG electrodes um, so that we can clean our EEG data and take out that influence. Um, we do lose a lot of electrodes using this method since we have to um, use them just to collect noise. But for our case, we're primarily interested in the occipital electrodes since the, that's where occipital alpha is seen and that's the primary measure of electrophysiological arousal that we're using. So it was okay for us to sacrifice these electrodes in order to clean the data. Later, I'll tell you about a, a study that, or same study, but a second experiment that we did at seven Tesla. Um, and we did do simultaneous EEG on one subject for that as well. And at seven Tesla, you can't have any metal in the scanner, scanner at all. So we use an ink net, which was specifically designed for EEG acquisition at 7T. And this uh, EEG cap uses conductive ink instead of copper wire, which is super cool, um, but it is more difficult to collect at 7T. Okay, so um, this is how we measured electrophysiological arousal. But like I mentioned, we also captured behavioral arousal. So before I tell you about the task, um, you might be wondering how we even get subjects to sleep in the scanner. Because if you've been in an fMRI scanner, you know it's not really the most conducive environment for sleeping. It can be very loud and very cramped. Um, so what we do is to have the subjects sleep only four hours the night before scanning, and then we begin scans at 10 p.m. So subjects are pretty tired by the time they're coming in, and this helps them fall asleep in the scanner despite the very loud noises and uncomfortable position that you might have to be in. We have them do a self-paced behavioral task um, to monitor their behavioral arousal state. So rather than having a stimulus, like an auditory stimulus where they have to respond to the auditory stimulus, we just ask them to press a button on every breath in and out. And that lets us monitor their arousal state without potentially influencing, um, influencing it, like playing an auditory stimulus and waking them up from sleep. We defined behavioral arousal as the first button press after 20 seconds without behavior. So 
sorry. Um, essentially, subjects will stop pressing the button when they fall asleep. And then when they wake up, they start pressing the button again. So we're really looking at that moment that behavior returns. And that's what I'm going to, most of the data I'm going to show you is just looking at this specific moment of behavioral arousal. So first we wanted to um, look at the EEG alpha power during behavioral arousal because um, we wanted to confirm that this actually was a transition and arousal state and not just people like getting a hand cramp and stopping pressing and then starting again, which if you've worked with human subjects, you know happens sometimes. So this is just a demonstration from a single behavioral arousal, um, which these black dots are button presses and the dotted line is the moment of behavioral arousal. And then this black line is just the alpha power during that time. So you can see that there's an increase during this arousal. Um, and that's a marker of wakefulness. So uh, this told us that this subject was awakening from sleep with the behavioral arousal. So now I'm going to go into the results and show you a bit of more information about the thalamus and cortex and what's happening in the brain during behavioral arousal. Are there any questions about methods up to this point? Awesome, okay. Wait, hold on, we do have a question. Okay, awesome. Uh, one sec, here we go. Okay, is it? Okay, cool. Uh, so you had people sleep four hours the night before. What time were you usually scanning? Was it like in between nine to five or in the evenings? It's in the evening. So they come in at either nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, depending on if we're going to do EEG. So it's very late and we usually end at like 1230. Okay, nice. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Uh, how long was the scan and uh, did you guys look at like pupillometry and whatnot to track if they are closing their eyes and all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, first of all, the scan went for about an hour and a half. So there's plenty of opportunity for these subjects to transition between sleep and wakefulness. We did not collect pupil pu pupillometry data. Um, we could have potentially in this first experiment at 3T, but we asked the subjects to keep their eyes closed the whole time um, so that we can measure that occipital alpha. But there are probably instances where the subjects are opening their eyes, um, which is one of the reasons that we decided to look at behavior instead of just EEG, because if someone wakes up from sleep and opens their eyes, then there's not gonna be that return of occipital alpha. Um, and then for our second experiment at 7T, it's not possible to get the eye tracker into the scanner because the bore is too small, unfortunately. Okay, uh, but if that's the case, then if you are scanning them with their eyes closed, that will definitely have a change in their alpha power, like just as in general, right? Right, if they actually keep their eyes closed the whole time and they wake up and they keep their eyes closed, you'll see a return of occipital alpha. Hi, right. so uh, my question is about the BCG reduction method. Mm -hmm. So I have very limited familiarity with this, but um, I do know that there are algorithms that exist to reduce that without limiting your number of electrodes. Is the reason you guys chose um, to have that trade off of fewer electrodes because you don't like the available algorithms, like you don't think they work as well? Or is it more to do with the methodology? Like, does it not work well with fast MRI in particular? Yeah, so um, I think that other people in the lab have tried uh, some of those algorithms and it just doesn't get the data as clean. Um, we also do some scans with copper wire loops instead of the BCG, um, the cap, which makes it, which does give us more electrodes, but the data still isn't as clean as when we use the reference layer. So it really just does a better job at removing that noise. Um, but I personally haven't messed around with it too much since we really just only need a few electrodes. It doesn't um, hurt our collection too much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think that's the end of the questions for now. Awesome, thank you so much everyone, I appreciate it. Okay, so we can get into some of the results. Um, so first we just looked at the average occipital alpha power during that behavioral arousal. 
So here the dotted black line is the behavioral arousal. On top, I'm showing the average alpha power over all 66 behavioral arousals from these six subjects. And on the bottom, I'm showing the spectrogram. So there is a significant increase in the alpha power during behavioral arousal. And that's also reflected in the spectrogram. You can kind of see this stripe coming back when people wake up from sleep. Um, so this told us that a canonical arousal state transition is occurring during behavioral arousals. So we felt comfortable moving forward with this analysis um, and really considering this behavioral arousal to be a cortical transition. While previously it was known that deep brain regions activate and cortex deactivates during waking up from sleep, um, the timing of that was unclear. So we looked at the average thalamus signal, which is here in red, and the average cortical signal, which is just the, um, all the gray matter in the cortex, which is in blue. And we found that the thalamus actually begins to activate seconds before behavioral arousal while the cortex deactivates afterwards. Um, and the time of activation was marked as the time it reaches 20% of its maximum ampl absolute amplitudes. So that's what these red arrows here are denoting. And this was really interesting to us to see that the change in thalamus was occurring before change in cortex and really demonstrating that this transition might be more driven by deep brain regions such as the thalamus. However, if we look across different regions of the cortex, so we looked at 30 different regions of the cortex, which we segregated using um, the Duskin Kalani Atlas. And we found that specifically the caudal anterior cingulate, which is here in purple, and the posterior cingulate, which isn't shown on this slide, both activated before behavioral arousal, more similarly to the thalamus while other cortical regions such as the superior temporal in blue and the rostral medial frontal in pink deactivated afterwards. So the cingulate regions are kind of diverging from the typical cortical patterns that we saw. Um, we did see that most cortical regions decreased, however. Here we're looking at just the correlation between each of the cortical regions and the thalamus as a whole, which is shown on top, and the cortex as a whole, which is shown on the bottom. And uh, you can see that most regions are highly correlated with the cortex. So most of them really are decreasing after behavioral arousal, but a small subset of regions, including the caud caudal anterior cingulate and the posterior cingulate activate beforehand and are more correlated with the thalamus. And you can really tell that they pop out here as having um, uh, activity that's more similar to the, the, to the thalamus and the cortex. So next we wanted to, investigate the dynamics of individual nuclei of the thalamus, which I mentioned in the beginning was our primary, primary, uh, primary goal. So the thalamus is very deep in the brain and its individual nuclei are very small. So we wanted to do this experiment at seven Tesla instead of three Tesla, because that increase in um, magnetic strength really increases the amount of uh, signal to, really increases the signal to noise ratio. So here in blue, this is um, the bold signal during a stimulus at 7T and in red, the same stimulus at 3T. And you can see that you get a much higher signal to noise ratio at 7T as compared to 3T. So we are really excited to be able to do this experiment at such high field and really capture information from these individual thalamic nuclei. So for this study, um, the TR was even, the temporal resolution was even shorter than before. So it was 0 0.247 seconds, which is quite fast. We still have 2.5 millimeter cubed isotropic voxels, but we're gonna be getting a lot more information from those voxels at this high field. We still have a simultaneous multi-slice factor of eight. And in this experiment, we have 13 subjects and 97 behavioral arousals. We did record simultaneous EEG in one subject, but since we had already um, seen that behavioral arousal and uh, the alpha power were locked, we decided to just do one subject and make it a little bit easier on ourselves. 
So um, we segmented the thalamus into nine specific nuclei. We used a probabilistic atlas, which told us the probability that each individual anatomical voxel was in uh, each nucleus. And then we interpolated those probabilities into functional space where there's larger voxels and only kept the voxels that had a 90% probability or higher of being within each individual nucleus. And these are the nuclei um, where we had a 90% probability that we were capturing them in all subjects, that there was one voxel that was capturing them in all subjects. So first we just repeated what we did in experiment one where we looked at the average alpha power during behavioral arousal. So here the black dotted line is still behavioral arousal. The top is average alpha power and the bottom is the spectrogram. This is only six arousals, which is why it's a bit less clear than um, in the previous study, which had 66. You can see that there still is this increase in alpha, but it actually occurs after behavioral arousal in this case. Nevertheless, we saw this and this confirmed that this was a cortical transition happening during behavioral arousal in that one subject. Then we replicated our results that the thalamus activated before arousal and the cortex deactivated afterwards. And we were super happy with this because it looks almost identical, which rarely happens when you uh, try to replicate experiments. So um, this confirmed that we were capturing the same type of behavioral arousal that we were in experiment one. Okay, so um, now we actually were able to look at the individual thalamic nuclei and the timing across them. We calculated lags between each nucleus and the whole thalamus. So we're comparing each nucleus's time series to the thalamus as a whole. When we did that, we found groups of early and late nuclei. So in this figure, the now the black dashed line is just the timing that would be equivalent to the thalamus as a whole. So if the lag is at zero, that means that the timing is the same as the thalamus, the whole thalamus. Um, so here the black bar is the mean, is the lag of the mean time series uh, across all 97 behavioral arousals, and then the shaded box is the 95% confidence interval. So as you can see, the central median nucleus and the ventral posterior lateral nucleus are activating early, are activating ahead of the thalamus as a whole, while the ventral anterior, enteroventral, and ventral lateral anterior are activating late. And this was really cool to see these two nuclei pop out, especially the central medial nucleus, because um, it's an intralaminar nucleus and neighboring intralaminar nuclei have been stimulated and can cause arousal state transitions. Whereas if you stimulate interventral, it doesn't cause arousal state transitions. So this was really cool to see the one intralaminar nucleus that we were able to record actually pop out early. The ventral posterior lateral nucleus is a bit more of a mystery and wouldn't have been predicted from previous literature. So the ventral posterior lateral nucleus is a somatosensory um, nucleus, which is a primary sensory nucleus. Um, so it's, we're not sure why it activates early, but it's really interesting that um, these results kind of implicate that it might be more involved in arousal state transitions than some of the other thalamic nuclei. And here we have just an image of the functional voxels overlaid on an anatomical slice of the thalamus. And you can see that they're anatomically distinct and you can kind of see how um, the sequence spreads across the thalamus. Next, we wanted to confirm the sequence by using a second technique. So we fit the hemodynamic response, a hemodynamic response function, to each of the mean signals from the thalamic nuclei. And we determined onset time to be the 10% um, bold signal of the maximum. So 10% of the maximum bold signal. And we found a super similar sequence across the thalamic nuclei. Here the colors are representing their order in the sequence, the lag sequence from red to purple. And you can see that the warm colors are in the beginning and the cool colors are late. So this confirmed that um, this activation sequence occurred before behavioral arousals and thalamic nuclei. Um, I can take questions on this. This is like our main result. So if you guys have questions, I can take them now before we move on a bit. OK, 
Hey, yeah, I can ask a question. Um, does it matter how long you're asleep for, for what you're doing? Cause you said like, I think 20 seconds for a pause and then behavioral. Did you see a lot of variability in that? And does it make a difference? Yep. So there definitely is a variability. Um, we didn't segment the behavioral arousals into the amount of time they were asleep for this analysis, um, just because we needed a higher in in order to actually be able to see these sequences. Um, but for just like the thalamic activation, um, oh, sorry. Oh, for the thalamic activation, we didn't see a difference. Um, in those two cases. And later I'll show you um, looking at the amount of time they stay awake afterwards. So that's a great question. It kind of leads into what we'll be looking at in a bit. Cool. That makes sense. And then I might have missed it. I was just wondering what your voxel size was. Yeah, the voxel size is 2.5 millimeters cubed, which is fairly large. Um, we, you, When you're imaging faster, you kind of have to balance between like how fast you want to image and how big your voxel sizes are. Um, but so we weren't able to capture all of the thalamic nuclei, um, but these nine thalamic nuclei are, were large enough for us, uh, large enough for us, uh, sorry, large enough, wow, I cannot say the sentence. Okay, large enough for us to capture with the 2.5 voxels. Yeah, that makes sense. Did you guys do <laughs> coverage or just like a part so that you could do smaller things or like faster? Um, so in this case, since we also wanted to look at cortical dynamics, we have most of the brain. Um, it you, we miss part of the parietal lobe, but we get almost full brain coverage, and we don't get cerebellum. Yeah. Cool. Other yeah. questions? All right, I think we're good. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks for struggling with me on that sentence too. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, while this result, result was really exciting when we first saw it, we have to also consider the endogenous hemodynamic lags that exist across the brain. So we know that um, the bold signal timing isn't the same across the whole brain. So we need to take that into account because it could be possible that the early nuclei are early only because um, of their specific hemodynamic response in general and not because they're actually contributing earlier to arousal. So in order to test this, we did a breath hold control. So in this control, we have subjects hold their breath for 15 seconds, um, which is here in purple. And when you hold your breath, the brain compensates for this decrease in oxygen by with vasodilation. So um, there, there will be vasodilation in the brain so that the brain can get more oxygen despite there being less oxygen because you're not breathing. Then when subjects begin breathing again, there's this increase in the bold signal because of the vasodilation that is caused just because of um, vascular vasculature and not because of neural activity. So this was our control looking at how the hemo just the hemodynamics respond um, to the breath hold task. In this control, we found that the thalamus leads the cortex by only 0.12 seconds. And this is consistent with other studies showing that deep brain regions have a slightly faster hemodynamic response than cortex, but it can't explain this um, lag between thalamus and cortex of seconds during behavioral arousal. Um, so here the dotted black line, sorry, dotted purple line is when they begin breathing again. So when they release their breath hold. Then we repeated our lag analysis with each of the thalamic nuclei. So we're still looking at the time lag relative to the whole thalamus. And we saw that most thalamic nuclei don't have a significant lag, except the anteroventral nucleus, which ended up being later. And this could be because of its specific vasculature or um, potentially some partial volume effects um, because it is next to a ventricle. Um, but overall, this confirmed that the sequence that we saw wasn't just due to the endogenous hemodynamic lags. Then we looked at systemic physiology because as I'm sure you guys have witnessed before, when someone falls asleep, there's a big change in their respiration and um, heart rate. So we know that respiration and heart rate can affect the bold signal as well. 
Um, so it's really hard to disentangle these two uh, metrics when you're studying arousal state transitions because we know that these changes are occurring. So we looked at the average respiration amplitude as well as the average pulse oximeter amplitude. And we saw that there was a significant change, which confirms this is an arousal, arousal state transition. And this is locked to behavioral arousal again with this black dotted line. But it occurred after or at the transition rather than before. So this told us that the activation sequence across the lambic nuclei that we're seeing before behavioral arousal um, is not just due to these, cha these systemic changes. Okay. Lastly, uh, we were able to look at two different cases of behavioral arousals. So in one case, um, subjects would wake up and stay awake. So they would continue to press the button after this transition and that we defined as a sustained arousal. And then sometimes subjects wake up very briefly and then fall directly back asleep. So we called those transient arousals when there's two or less clicks. And here in this figure, we're just showing the total number of button presses, the black dashed line at time zero is behavioral arousal. Um, across these two different arousal types. And you can see in pink, the sustained arousal, they continue behaving. And in purple with the transient arousal, the behavior drops off really quickly. So we investigated the dynamics from the whole thalamus and the whole cortex during this time. We found that in the thalamus, it returns to a higher baseline in sustained arousals than in transient arousals. So this difference in arousal state is really being reflected in the thalamus. However, in the cortex, we didn't see a significant difference between these two states. And we did look across all cortical regions and there was only one region that had even a single time bin that was significant. Um, so this is really consistent across the cortex that there wasn't a significant difference between sustained and transient arousals, which is really surprising. Um, and this, to us told us that um, this change in cortex might actually be driven by those systemic physiological changes that I saw that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, because if you compare this, these dynamics with the pulse exometer amplitude, it actually looks really similar. Um, but this was an unexpected result that uh, the difference in states was reflected in thalamus, but not in cortex. So in conclusion, we uncovered precise temporal patterns that were coupled to both the moment of behavioral arousal and the stability of the subsequent arousal state. It, this reinforces the role of the thalamus in arousal state transitions and identified distinct functional profiles for the device, diverse nuclei in the thalamus with central median nucleus and ventral posterior lateral nucleus activating first. Overall, this suggests a broad potential for fast ultra high field fMRI to identify the temporal dynamics of subcortical activity within the human brain. So this is really exciting that we can start to look at the temporal dynamics and not just the spatial dynamics um, of the fMRI signal. So I want to give a big thank you to everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to come talk to you. And thank you for giving me another chance after I got the time wrong last time, which was super tragic. Um, I want to thank my lab, especially Dr. Laura Lewis, Dr. Daniel Gomez, Nina Foltz, and Stephanie Williams, who are my co-authors on all of the results that I just showed you, um, my program, and um, the Hariri Institute at BU. So thank you so much. So are there any more questions on the results? Is there anyone having a question on her last part of the presentation? <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, I have another behavioral question, um, especially for those last set of results. Were participants aware that they were waking up? Or like both of those states are either, or do we know? So we didn't really ask afterwards. Um, I would assume, so, are you wondering like if they noticed that they stopped clicking, like if, and then they were, and then they woke up and they're like, oh, I did just transition, I need to start clicking again. 
that kind of thing? Or? Yeah, I think I'm mostly just curious, like, would, would I remember if I, like, woke up and pressed the button one time and then fell back asleep? Like, would I remember doing that? Mm. Would yeah, it make- that's a good question. Sustained versus other one, like, do you know for the, for the sustained awake, but not for the transient or something like that? Yeah, no. So we weren't able to actually um, parse that out because we didn't want to influence their arousal state. So we didn't like check in with them after each arousal. We just kind of let them do their thing and transition in and out. But it is super interesting. And I would guess that they probably wouldn't remember just the one click. But um, since it is such just like a brief arousal and then they already forgot to click again, like two seconds later. But it is a super interesting question. Yeah, it's just strange to think that, like, I am making responses, like, I'm doing things, but I might not know, like, later, like, remember doing that. Yeah, definitely. Behavior and arousal state is actually super interesting because um, subjects can actually continue behaving in, in one sleep. So you can, like, technically be asleep and still be doing this task, which is part of why we didn't look at the transition to sleep, um, because it's much more gradual. Whereas like when you wake up, it's uh, a bit more abrupt, but it's a really interesting phenomenon and kind of demonstrates how um, transient the sleep process can be. That's so interesting. Um, We have another question. So I had two questions. Uh, The first is um, I liked a lot that you guys went in and looked at the respiration and heart rate changes in that time to make sure that that wasn't a problem. Um, But did you guys see anything related to motion, like with people moving more or moving either when they were falling asleep or when they were waking up that was you guys had to grapple with? Oh, yeah, definitely. So when you're sleep scoring, actually, one of the ways that you define arousal is by motion. So um, that was definitely something we had to keep in mind. And what we ended up doing was just excluding any arousal where there was more than 0.3 millimeters um, total of motion. So we just kind of excluded those events. And then my second question is, now that you've done kind of your first analysis looking at associations with the cortex, do you have any plans to go in and shrink your voxel size or go a little faster to get at more of those uh, nuclei in the thalamus? Yeah, um, so another student in the lab, Nick Cicero, is starting a study where we're actually going to look at brainstem nuclei. So trying to shrink those voxels down to like 1.2 millimeter cubed. Um, to see like how locus ceruleus is activating during these kinds of transitions. Yeah, so that's spot on. (laughs) Awesome, thank you. Thanks. I think I saw a question in the chat. Someone had their hand raised. Yeah, I I had my hand up, but uh, my question was the same about motion to see how that would play out. So they beat me to it. (laughs) Yeah, you guys are absolutely correct. That's an issue. Uh, this one's just going to be a quick hypothetical, but you're looking at transitions out from, say, uh, what is it, um, like stage one sleep at this point, right? Uh, have you considered looking at uh, how this might play out in deeper stages of sleep? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So we did do sleep scoring um, in experiment one where we were looking at that return of occipital alpha, and there was a mix of stage one and stage two sleep. Um, it would be interesting to see if there's a difference between those two stages. Uh, that's not possible with the amount of data we have right now. And I kind of, my intuition says that the thalamic activity would be similar between those two stages since you're transitioning to the same state. But um, it would be really interesting to see. And even if we could see transitions between arousal states would be cool too, to see how those are unfolding. Like, sorry, between the sleep stages, like between um, stage one and stage two sleep. Um, So we're actually collecting more data right now, doing the same experiment at 7T, but with EEG. So we might be able to answer some of those questions in the future. Are there any more questions? Uh, I think we're done today. Thanks for coming. Paul, you're just so nice. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of your questions. It's really exciting to be able to talk to you all about this. I really appreciate the opportunity.
yeah, let's thank to the speaker today. Thank you.